I think we are ready to get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special Pride Month and Walt Whitman event. Uh, my name is Caitlin Shea. I am the Events and Media Director for Walt Whitman Birthplace Association. And if you're not familiar with us just yet, we are a museum located in Long Island, New York in Huntington. And you can come visit us to see the house that Walt Whitman was born in 202 years ago. I emphasize 202 because Walt Whitman's birthday was actually this past Monday, May 31st. And we managed to have a wonderful celebration despite not being able to get together in person. Uh, we invited all of our fans, all the Whitmaniacs to send in videos uh, of themselves reading from Leaves of Grass or uh, art that was inspired by Walt Whitman. And we received over 55 entries, uh, which was wonderful. And we were able to put together a beautiful video. Uh, so many people have been writing saying, you know, it's a two hour event. They weren't sure if they were gonna sit through the whole two hours. And then they said it was so beautiful just seeing all these voices coming together. Uh, so definitely check that out on our YouTube. I'll be posting links in the chat of uh, our YouTube, our Facebook, and all of our social media. So please stay with us after this if you're just learning about us now. And we have so many Zoom events just like this. So I invite you to keep joining us after tonight if it's your first time. Uh, and I always wanna start every single event by saying thank you so much to everyone who's able to donate. It really means so much to us. It makes events like this possible. And even something small like $5 that you might spend on a, a cup of Starbucks coffee, just something small like that means so much because it all adds up when you multiply it by all the people that we're meeting both nationally and internationally. Some of those videos we received were from Sweden and Britain. So it's just a wonderful experience to come together with other people that appreciate Whitman so much. And your presence tonight also means so much to us, really. Uh, so we hope to stay connected with you and thank you for every bit of support. We really appreciate it and we can continue having these events and having you join us like this. Uh, I wanna mention too, uh, as, as you have questions, you might wanna jot them down. We're gonna have everyone stay muted, but you can write in the chat during the event and we'll get to those questions and you can come on camera and ask your questions as well at the very end, all right? So we're gonna jump into our program now and we're going to have welcome remarks from Walt Women Birthplace Association Executive Director, Cynthia Shore. Cynthia, I'm handing it over to you. Uh, all right, thank you, Caitlin. Uh, yes, I'm the Executive Director of the Walt Women Birthplace Association and we operate the Walt Women Birthplace for New York State. The first thing I like to do at the top of the program is to give a shout out to Caitlin Shea. She is the engine that has kept our association running through COVID and beyond. So let's give a silent applause to Caitlin Shea. Yay, Caitlin. Uh, you really do a magnificent job and we appreciate it. And I hear from people across the world, uh, their praises for what you do and I join them. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. I also like to say a thank you to the Board of Trustees. I'm here on their behalf and representing them. Uh, they offer so much to the birthplace in their own support, in their scholarly research and their interest that they are the second major en engine, so to speak, of what keeps us all together here. So thank you to the board and uh, thank you to all the community members who support us, the association members, and thank you to all of you locally and, be and beyond that, uh, Email us, contact us with one thing or another and show us your interest. We greatly appreciate that. I'd like to say thank you to Suffolk County. I'd like to say thank you to the town of Huntington where Walt was born. And I'd like to say thank you again to the community members and Humanities New York, which I know all our panelists are very familiar with their wonderful work. So uh, it's part of my great pleasure to, to give the thanks and to give the greeting. So I would like to uh, introduce our speakers and panel tonight. What I am going to do is uh, introduce them one by one at the top of the program now, and then uh, you'll hear more about them as the time goes on. So I will start by introducing Barbara Bear. She will be the moderator for the panel tonight. And by the way, this is the first of our Pride Month's uh, programs. So we're very excited to be offering you this today. Barbara Baer, a PhD. She's a curator of the Walt Whitman Manuscript Collections at the Library of Congress. 
where she is a historian in literature, culture, and the arts, and a member of the By the People Stakeholders Committee. And you'll hear more about that in the time to come tonight. Barbara earned her MA and PhD at Brown University. And as I said, she will be the moderator. She is a welcome host at the Library of Congress. She welcomed me and showed me Walt's walking cane and other of his artifacts in the library. So thank you, Barbara, for all you do for Walt and beyond. And uh, we welcome you tonight and thank you for joining us. Next, I'd like to introduce Zachary Turpin, PhD. He is an assistant professor of American literature at the University of Idaho and a former Klug fellow at the Library of Congress. See, everything comes full circle. He is a scholar of 19th century American periodical culture and digital archive research. He specializes in recovering the lost writings of 19th century authors. He has rediscovered two book length works by Walt Whitman, which are the 1852 novel called Life and Adventures of Jack Engel, and the 1858 men's wellness track, Manly Health and Training. And we've been so fortunate to have Zach at the birthplace live be before COVID and giving a presentation on his research and, uh, and his writings and his publications, and which you'll hear more tonight. He also is the author of Unknown Writings of, by Emma Lazarus, Kate Chopin, L. Frank Baum, Anne Sexton, and many more. He is currently writing a book for the Live Right on literary rediscoveries, thefts, and forgeries. And his articles have appeared in the Walt Whitman Quarterly Review and elsewhere. Welcome, Zach. It's wonderful to have you back on the Whitman stage, so to speak. Next, I'd like to introduce Matt Miller, PhD. He is an associate professor of English and chair of the department at Yeshiva University's Stern College in Manhattan, where he teaches American literature and creative writing. His work on Whitman includes Collage of Myself, Walt Whitman and the Making of Leaves of Grass, published by the University of Nebraska Press, and more recently, Every Hour, Every Atom, which we will be discussing tonight, a collection of Walt Whitman's early notebooks and fragments, co-edited by Zachary Turpin. Welcome, Matt. It's nice to have you back also. Thanks. And a, a newbie to the Whitman stage is Abby Shelton. She is a community manager and digital collection specialist for the By the People program at the Library of Congress. In her role, she supports the volunteers, the collections, and software applications that make crowdsourced transcription run smoothly. And we'll hear more from her about that too later on. Abby has an MA in US history from Binghamton University, SUNY, and an MSI in library, an MSL in library and science from Drexel University. I welcome all of you, our speakers and panelists tonight. And I invite you to share more of your lives and writings and interest as the evening goes on, which I know you will. So thank you very much for coming. Welcome to everyone. And now, Barbara, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm going to share my screen. And I wanted to start in tribute to Pride Month with a short love poem by Walt Whitman. This is from the Calamus cluster from the 1860 edition of Leaves of Grass. One flitting glimpse caught through an intercist of a crowd of workmen and drivers in a bar room around the stove late of a winter night and I unremarked seated in a corner of a youth who loves me and whom I love, silently approaching and seating himself near, that he may hold me by the hand, a long while amid the noises of coming and going, of drinking and oath and smutty jest. There we too, content, happy in being together, speaking little, perhaps not a word.
As one of our nation's most prominent foundational gay poets, Whitman has inspired and provided personal precedents for many LGBTQ poets since his time. Those who have been influenced by Whitman reach across races and generations, including Harlem Renaissance poet Langston Hughes, beat poet Allen Ginsberg, feminist poets June Jordan, Audre Lorde, Adrienne Rich and Mary Oliver, and contemporary poets, Jericho Brown and Mark Doty. Whitman wrote extensively about love, sex, and attraction and the elements of personal identity. He wrote of the bodies and sweat and labor of working men and of camaraderie and physicality and what he termed manly or athletic love. We see this throughout the body of his work in his poetry and prose and memoirs and correspondence, but we are treated to special insight when we study the genesis of his thinking and creative process in his early work as a freelance writer and through fragments and notes written in his notebooks. In the notebooks, he describes Civil War soldiers, the men he knew from the streets of New York. In philosophic thoughts, he figured into his initial editions of Leaves of Grass. In the poems themselves, we find imagery he used in his Calamus cluster of poems or in the bodies of men who in Song of Myself gathered to swim together at a watering hole or in description of the singular lover, lover met on the beach at night. Whitman used the 19th century phrenological terms adhesiveness, meaning love and attraction and bonding between men and amativeness or heterosexual love and attraction to describe and ponder what binds us one to another and frames or fosters our personal identities. He sometimes veiled meanings or spoken code, but he also insisted in his notebooks on open and frank talk of sex, procreation and bodily function and of sleepers and of lovers and those who are beloved. In his notebooks, we see Whitman developing himself into a poet of free verse and freed thought. In Pride Month, it is important to honor Whitman for taking pride in sex and gender and in exploring identity and status in society, arguing as he did in one of his notebooks that none of us are whole human beings without taking sexual identity into account or becoming aware of one another. And perhaps no poetry is authentic poetry that leaves out sex and self-definition issues. Today, we'll be talking, taking a close look at some of Whitman's notebooks and talking about transcription as an intimate way to get close to understanding Whitman and his creative process. Like the journalist that he was, Whitman often carried with him small, often handmade pocket-sized notebooks in which he jotted observations of all sorts and ideas for later writings. We're talking today especially about two projects involving Whitman notebooks, Zachary Turpin and Matt Miller's Every Hour, Every Atom, a collection of Walt Whitman's early notebooks and fragments, which is new in 2020 from the University of Iowa Press, and in which Zach and Matt present scholarly transcriptions of notebooks and fragments from several different archival repositories, including the Library of Congress and others. And the other project, the Library of Congress's newly launched by the People crowdsourcing campaign focused on Whitman's notebooks and diaries, specifically from the Charles E. Feinberg collection of Walt Whitman papers in the manuscript division. I'd like to start my questions with the topic of Genesis. Genesis both in terms of previous primary source research that helped inform work on these new transcription projects, and also Whitman's own genesis of ideas and creative techniques as we can see them evidenced in the notebooks and his early freelance writing. Zach, the first question comes to you. Before you teamed with Matt for every hour, every atom, you produced a modern edition of Walt Whitman's 1858 Manly Health and Training to teach the science of a sound and beautiful body. 
Could you tell us something about that discovery and the themes of manly physique and male bonding in Whitman's early freelance writing? Certainly. Thanks, Barbara. Sure. Um, of course, just as I begin talking, somebody is cutting wood next door. So I like to think Whitman, the house builder, would approve in some way. <laughs> um, yeah, manly health and training is something that I came across when I was just a sapling um, in my PhD program at the University of Houston. It's really not something that I expected. Um, I don't know that it's something anyone really expected, but certainly not me. This is not what I started my doctoral studies for particularly. Um, I, I think sometimes when I think about the kind of research I was doing at the time, I think about the scholar Stephen Ramsey's phrase, the hermeneutics of screwing around, which means more or less reading in archives, reading in digitized manuscripts, and simply wending your way without a kind of directive pursuit in mind. Um, but this came to light because of nothing bigger than a pseudonym of Whitman's. Um, and one literary notice in, it was like the New York Times, the New York Evening uh, Post or something like that. Manly Health and Training, this pseudonymous 47,000 word manifesto and urban men's wellness guide is really a remarkable document because uh, not only is it something that Whitman wrote and published sub rosa, you know, not under his own name, uh, the name that he had started, you know, Walt Whitman as opposed to Walter is, is this rough and ready uh, poet loafer persona that he had developed. Um, Mose Velser, who writes this book, is far more interested in the daily nitty gritty of physique and personal magnetism and, as you mentioned, phrenology and the attraction among men and cities of manly love, which is something he fantasizes about in um, Live Oak with Moss, which I think you may have read from earlier, or Calamus anyway. I think what's so fascinating about manly health training, and I will not blather here because we have a lot to talk about, but manly health and training to me is so wild because Whitman under this cover of a pseudonym is not that he really seems to edit himself that often. He's quite the sharer, but he seems very comfortable in exploring all sides of what it means to be a man or a person with a physique, a healthy human in America. Um, and many of the, the things that he talks about are really stunningly modern sounding. He talks about the necessity or not for shaving. He talks about the need for comfortable shoes, uh, canvas baseball shoes, which we would call sneakers or tennis shoes now, um, you know, regular diet and exercise and calisthenics and um, re relationships. But more than that, he is thinking about the development of the, what he calls the American race. And he's thinking forward into the future where we are and how best to promulgate this race of healthy Americans who will continue to expand outward and outward. Um, and what's most delightful of all is that many of the manuscripts that now exist at the Library of Congress and elsewhere are sort of like loose ends, little threads that point to this very document, which I'm sure we can talk more about. One of my favorite illustrations in, in the book is this um, one of, of, of manly exercise. And, you know, you talked about the book being modern and um, Matt, in your book, you also talk about modern aspects of, of Walt Whitman. But here we are in an age where visiting the gym and going to aerobics class and using barbells, they seem like new things, but they're just reinventing what Whitman was talking about, having a healthy, robust body. And I always think with some sadness about this era of his life and that he wrote this book and your discovery of it, given that he is later felled by a stroke and spends the end of his life as a half paralytic, as he says in one of his notebooks. So, you know, that whole issue of what happens to our bodies and our, and, um, our bodies as vessels of our souls. Matt, let's move on to you. And you wrote about Whitman's notebooks in your book, Collage of Myself, which was published in 2010. Can you tell us about your thinking about the notebooks at that time and the connection with resources in the online Walt Whitman archive? 
We also have a couple images to show of pages of a particular fragment notebook that you wrote about in detail in your book that is from the Feinberg collection and dates from the years just prior to the publication of the first edition of Leaves of Grass. So you can tell me when you'd like me to show those. Is that the Med Kapasis notebook fragment? It is. Great. So yeah, to get to your question, um, when I first started thinking in terms of this book, which is essentially my dissertation, which I read, I'm sorry, which I wrote under the direction of Ed Folsom, um, the Walt Whitman archive was just getting off the ground. Um, it existed, but it was nothing like the mono, you know, the monolithic online entity that we all use all the time today. And um, very little transcription work had been done. And this, this book was born largely out of um, my passion for transcribing the notebooks and especially an obsession I developed with the notebook that Whitman scholars refer to as the Talbot Wilson notebook. And I found that I had some things that I wanted to say about Whitman's writing process that I felt well suited to say. And um, Professor Folsom was very generous with his time and encouragement in the project. And so from the beginning, I would say Collage and Myself was a part of the Whitman archive. It, it is born directly out of my work for the archive, transcribing for the archive, wouldn't be possible without it. And I guess I'm kind of proud to, to, to that it's maybe the first book length study that came out of that work. Um, and I, I'm, you know, to, I'm, I'm happy about that. And um, the main, the thesis of it is that Walt Whitman invented literary collage in his writing process. Um, if you want me to expand on that in the context of the manuscript fragment now, might be a good time to turn to that. Okay, this particular slide shows the full two pages and then I have a detail which maybe is better for describing, depending on what part of the text you wanted to use. Um, I'll, yeah, just, the, I'll just note that at, in the Library of Congress, this notebook is called Women. And that's just because there is a statement about the status of women near the beginning. Um, maybe you wanna mention the way that you and Zach um, named the notebooks and why you would um, uh, call it the Med um notebook. This is just two, two leaves, um, four pages, and we don't know the order, um, which per se, so it just kind of depends on which part you pick is the opening page. Um, one, one page has the medical term medcaphosis, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, at the top, and another page has, has a different term, women, at the top. Um, so it's just a naming convention based on placement of that text. Um, and this was a pivotal, um, a pivotal find for me. Now, I didn't first discover this. That honor goes to a scholar named Vivian Pollock, who first noted that Whitman seemed to be thinking about different genres uh, of writing in, in a part of this. And that, that thinking dovetailed neatly with the thinking that I was engaged in for my dissertation. And so I, I took a look at it. And... Um, I kind of expanded on Vivian's original insight. Um, my reading of this is that these notes that you have highlighted in the transcription below about bringing in whole races, cast generations, that, that it sounds to me like he's talking about Song of Myself. Um, that's the major lengthy poem where he comes close to doing any of this stuff. It's the only one that really fits with this description. Um, voices of the generations of slaves, of those who suffer, lovers, night, day. This inclusive cosmic poem get, gets its start in terms of its thinking on the same page as Whitman is thinking about whether or not he wants his life work to be a poem, a play, or something he calls a spiritual novel. Um, so the fact that Whitman seems not to have even decided upon what genre his life's work's going to be. In short, he doesn't even know he's a poet when he's writing these remarks. I found that remarkable. That really blew my mind. And then through some other references on this, I was able to, I think, date the um, fragment to 1853, um, which is much later than it had been previously thought to have been composed in, in around 1847 or 48. And so if it's 1853, that suggests a much later date than we had previously thought for when Whitman even realized he was going to be a poet. 
So I argue based on this fragment that Whitman didn't even know he's gonna be a poet in late 1853 or early 1854. And that the whole process of becoming Walt Whitman took place in just a little over a year. And then I try to explore how he did that. I think in the book you talk about a mad rush or everything coming out of boil. Um, yeah, that's his own his own words. Um, he's, he's, he had different descriptions of his creative writing process for the first edition. And sometimes he said it took eight years and I started in 1847. And in another place, he says it all came in a boiling rush in about a year. And so scholars have debated which of those statements are correct. And previous the previous assumption was that the earlier date was correct except for one or two kind of ignored scholars. Um, everybody agreed that it was the earlier date, um, but I think I've proven that it's actually the later date and that Whitman became Walt Whitman in a remarkably short period of time. Or there's the famous letter from Emerson, of course, and the statement that there must've been a long foreground somewhere to have produced leaves of grass. And I think it's one way to think about the notebooks. And you know, you've basically pro proven that that these the notebooks are the foreground, and also the kinds of things that Zach had discovered in the archives in terms of the freelance writings. So the long foreground was in prose, right? Exactly. And the short foreground was the discovery of his line, I guess. And, and yet the ideas and the themes and that some of the language, the play with the language. Sure. I, do, I do love the language that's on this particular page that not only the reference to a child went forth, but to bring in whole races and his use of caste. And he uses the word caste or caste elsewhere in the notebooks as well. That's a word that's come back into the nomenclature with Isabel Wilkerson's new book. And um, you know the concept of what does caste mean in society. And um, you know the the personification of general objects of creation and giving voice, um, equal voice. He talks elsewhere in this about women being equal with men. And here, you know, there's a lot of question about Whitman and race. And here he's talking about the generations of slaves. This is the man who's going to be producing icing the body electric very shortly after this. And and perhaps most exciting of all, the first time he ever uses the phrase leaf of grass, as far as we know, here in the singular, instead of leaves of grass, it's leaf of grass. But I believe this is the, as far as we can tell, this seems to be the first time he ever thinks of that. So that's a pretty, pretty remarkable, important moment there. You know, that's- it, It's cool. amazing. You can see it, it's right above the little pointy hand known as a manicule on the left there. Um, there's like two M dashes and the topmost one says a leaf of grass with its equal, I can't quite make that word out. I forget what it's it is. It's equal voice. Equal voice, that's right, equal voice. And do you wanna tell us what the manicule is? You and Zach use manicules in every hour, every atom. And well, people have been listening to me a lot. Why don't I hand this one over to Zach? Sure, Zach, tell us what a <laughs> manicule is. Sure, a manicule is one of Whitman's favorite doodles, probably the most favorite. It is that little pointing hand, typically pointing to the left or right with the, with the index finger and a thumb. Um, it's, for Whitman, it's almost certainly coming from his many years editing and typesetting and writing for newspapers. Manicules are thoroughly used in 19th century New York uh, newspapers as well as everywhere else to just sort of indicate items of interest. You know, it's, it's almost like a separator in some ways or an indicator. And so Whitman would all often kind of jot these in really quick to point to an item of particular emphasis or interest for himself. Um, and if you, if you want later, when we talk about transcribing these notebooks and fragments and the choices we had to make, um, turning the manicule into a, a text version, you know, taking it from orthography to typography was, was actually a pretty granular discussion. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Let, we'll get to that. I want to move on to Abby. And um, Abby, you, you have a new brand new edited anthology out that you did with Adriana Link and Patrick Spiro of the American Philosophical Society. It's called Indigenous Languages and the Promise of Archives. What connections do you see between your work on that project and your role as a community manager for By the People? Yeah, that's and if you want to, you know, tell us some of the basic concepts behind by the people crowdsourcing. Sure. 
Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great question because it's a, a slightly different topic, I guess, than what we're here to talk about today. But um, both the the volume that I worked on um, and what we're doing at the APS Library, and then what we're doing at the Library of Congress, um, is really opening up these collections. Um, in the case of the APS, the Indigenous collections, and in the case of the Library of Congress, um, a really wide array of diverse collections to the public. Um, and not just opening them up, you know, like you can come and see them, but actually opening them up so that you can um, participate and contribute back to them. So in the case of um, some of the indigenous collections that were at the um, APS library, we actually um, collaborated with indigenous partners to um, describe, interpret, and manage the collections. So really giving full um, archival power over to those communities of origin. Um, and at the Library of Congress with By the People, um, which is our crowdsourcing transcription program, um, we're doing a similar sort of thing. Um, so anyone who has an internet connection and an interest can um, go to our website, which um, is on the screen there. I think it will also be in chat um, and explore digitized collections. Um, that the library has um, put online and then also transcribe them. So, um, you know, for example, uh, with the Whitman collections, um, the notebooks and diaries are there. Uh, there's over 300 or over 3000 pages, excuse me, of Whitman notebooks and diaries. And um, people are working on them from all over the world. Um, once those documents are fully transcribed um, and reviewed, so they go through a two-step two process where one volunteer will transcribe and then one will review for accuracy, uh, we actually return that information back into the library's main catalog where it can be searched um, and accessed by those who maybe have trouble reading handwriting. I think, as we all saw on the slide before, um, Handwriting, especially for these fragile notebooks, can be difficult to read. Um, and then it can also be used for folks who might use assistive technologies like screen readers. Um, so, so far at the Library of Congress, um, over the three year history of this transcription program, um, we have um, partnered with over 25,000 registered volunteers. Um, now those are just people who have registered for an account. We have countless people who transcribe anonymously. Um, and those folks have transcribed over 320,000 pages um, of library collections, which, which is incredible. And I think overall, you know, in both, in both cases um, with, with indigenous collections um, at the APS and at the library, um, I think this is just part of a, a larger move um, within um, cultural heritage institutions, be they museums, um, historic sites, libraries, to uh, throw open the treasure chests that we have um, to the public to connect more um, people um, really around the world to these collections and also to engage them in a, in a new way. Um, and I, I think we'll talk a little bit uh, later on about our volunteers, but um, you know, it's it's really a mutually beneficial process. Um, so I think our our volunteers gain as much from the work of transcribing um, as the library does from the information that they produce. Um, so it's um, a fairly new program for the library. It's like I said, only about three years old. Um, but it's already um, produced uh, just incredible amounts of engagement uh, with people all over the world. Thank you, Abby. Um, one of the things I thought about when I looked at your indigenous language um, book is about the use of vernacular. And it's very much about Indian languages and the use of vernacular terms, vocabulary. And of course, Whitman was fascinated by this and about American back, uh, vernacular. And one of the notebooks that is in the By the People project is the one for his intended dictionary in which he gathers words of all types and defines them. And also in the notebooks, we see him thinking about writing various kinds of poems. And among the poems he thinks about writing are about indigenous peoples or aboriginal, as he says, names and places. And that he, of course, would incorporate terms like Pomanoc and Manahata into his poetry and in his writing. I think he would have really liked your book. 
it's good to know. Right. So this slide is just a kind of placeholder why we go on and talk more, but um, I liked it, um, you know, partly because we talked about manly training and this is sort of about womanly training. Um, here, Whitman celebrates the physical fitness and rights to public assembly of women. And we can use it as a backdrop in honor of Title IX. Again, sort of Whitman is looking forward into his modern times and also the upcoming Olympics. While we talk more about what we get out of close engagement with Whitman's writings by transcribing them and the art of transcription and the intimacy it creates. And here, I wanted to start with um, Zach and Matt, you two together. Um, could you tell us the story of how you came to do every hour, every atom? What was the genesis for you to do the book? And then could you tell us a little bit about how you collaborated? What was your working process? And how did you create the transcriptions for the book? You want me to start? Go for it, Matt. All right, I'll, I'll talk for a little bit and then hand it over to you. Um, it might be more appropriate in a way if, if Zach started, but I'll go ahead because Zach had this book going um, before we met. Um, I was aware of Zach's work from, you know, the moment he discovered uh, Manly Health and Training and he was on my horizon and I was quite eager to meet him when I heard that he was going to be talking at a 200th anniversary birthday celebration for Walt Whitman in New York City at the Grawlier Club. I was really excited because I'd admired his work from afar. And um, so the, the project was well underway then when we met and we started talking about it. We, we went to a bar after all the talks and presentations were over with and we just got really engaged with it. I didn't want it to end. And I um, invited him back to my apartment and we, we took the train across the East River back to my place in Queens and just kept talking. We went for a long walk in the park and um, I just, we kind of hit it off and our interests were so similar and our passion for Whitman's unpublished writings were, uh, we, you know, I don't think I'd ever met anyone who shared the same enthusiasm I have for it. And we could talk in granular detail about these things that only the two of us maybe, and maybe a couple other people, but not a whole lot of folks. You know, it's exciting when you can find somebody else that can talk about your scholarly interests on that level. And out of that, um, I believe, I'll, I'll give it over to Zach and, at this point, and you can explain how it came about from there, maybe? What do you think? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, Matt is right that we, I think we immediately clicked, not only because of our shared interests in, you know, manuscripts and notebooks like the sort that you're seeing here, and also because we had heard of one another, and I think we're just sort of, you know, magnetized in each other's direction, but also because we shared a certain, I don't know, uh, a conviction that there were problems is not the correct correct word precisely, but there, there is a, there was a sort of gap between the ways in which readers of Whitman engage with his notebooks and manuscripts and the ways in which we thought that they could engage with them. Um, I, I think a decent example would, would be, and if I had a copy of it here, I would show it to you, but Matt and I had both worked, besides looking either, Matt had been to the Library of Congress and literally held these manuscripts in his hand, which I had not, but for the most part, um, beyond the actual textual item, a primary way to look at these notebooks or fragments was to open the New York University Press academic volumes of them, which were edited by Edward Greer and William White um, over more than a decade. I mean, these are really solid academic sources that I still thoroughly fetishize personally as an academic. But the, there was a problem that we both realized that we felt about these, which is that they don't give you the notebooks. They give you the content of the notebooks at a remove or a set of removes. And the, I think the one that maybe encapsulated it the most for me is that if you open any of those volumes, you can find them in all sorts of libraries, you'll find that in addition to uh, editorial apparatus, you know, the provenance of the manuscript, a description of its size and its inks and its papers, um, that the text itself is provided in a, in a, for lack of a better term, finished form. So in a lot of these, particularly Greer's six volume notebooks and unpublished prose manuscripts, anything that is struck out is relegated to a footnote at the bottom. And you are getting what feels like 
you know, Whitman's ostensible final form of, of these notebooks and fragments. And there's nothing wrong with this inherently, you know, Edward Greer is not only Towering's Whitman scholar, he was working under the typographical constraints that New York University Press had in the 70s and 80s or maybe 60s too, I forget precisely when they were edited. I think it was the 70s or 80s. The trouble then is that you don't see the notebooks. You don't see all the strike throughs. You don't see the long hash marks, get, you know, like striking through a whole page. Uh, as you can see here, there's all sorts of um, superscripts and scrawlings and manicules. They're, they're really messy and, and you can kind of feel the ferment when you look at them with your eyes. And we realize that we had never really seen these represented as such in text, in a book that you could hold in your hand uh, that wasn't six volumes that cost a lot and that crack your lap. Um, and that it could be done in a way that would both uh, do justice to what we can see on the screen here, but would also be readable and affordable and put this Whitman in people's hands, a Whitman that most have never really seen. Just to add to that briefly, like for, from a you know scholarly point of view, one of my drives to want to do this was to provide people with the the means to be able to read the notebooks. This is you know related directly to what Zach was just saying, closer to how Whitman composed them, as opposed to encountering them only through a database. I'm a big believer that if you start with the database as your interface for a text, that it greatly um, greatly enhances the odds that you're going to wind up what you might call cherry picking that source for whatever scholarly interests uh, you're looking for, especially with Whitman. You're, you, there's a good chance if you look for it, you're going to find it because there's just such a huge paper trail. So you pick some 19th century interest that you might have and you plug it into a database. You see, oh, I'm just going to make a number up 10 references, right, to that. You think, wow, Whitman was super passionate about shoes. <laughs> um, and then you read the notebook and it's like, well, it's just because he wrote so damn much that it, that may, that, that it came up that many times. Um, so when you have, when you hold a book like this and you read them in this form, I'm going to call it analog form as opposed to digital. Um, it's, it gives you a new perspective. And I think you see Whitman's brain more intimately and accurately than database driven reading provides. I find it enormously readable. And um, I think of it as like a nightstand book. It's just wonderful where you can pick it up. You can you know, read a notebook at a time. You can pick passages. Um, your annotations are really interesting. And so I, you know, I see it as a, a you know, real success as a one volume analog edition that's doing just what you're hoping in terms of giving Whitman to an audience in a new way. So congratulations on it. Um, I, I, I'll go back to the slide before, cause we're still, Abby, I also wanted to ask you more about by the people crowdsourcing and it's a kind of different collaboration engagement. You work on a team and, um, you're, there's also a lot of outreach that's involved in engagement of by the volunteers. Did you want to say a little bit about the volunteers and the affinity groups that by the people works with? Sure, um, and I guess I'll uh, preface by um, addressing what Matt said as well. I think that's so true that you know, at least in the, you know what we're doing in terms of digitized collections, um, people can get to them as single pages, um, and so sometimes the the context um, is missing, and you do have to do a little bit of digging. But I think, you know, to connect that to Barbara, your question, I think for us, you know, the goal is as much the engagement and the connection with the people. Um, volunteering and contributing as it is the actual product um, and the transcriptions that come out of it. Um, because uh, like I alluded to earlier, um, I think what we're doing is allowing people to connect with these collections in a way um, that is active um, rather than you know what they might normally get at the library when they come. Um, to see an exhibit or, or what have you. Um, but we have a pretty broad uh, volunteer base. So we have about 25,000 registered volunteers, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and they run the gamut from you know, subject matter experts um, 
you know, credentialed scholars to uh, just people who are enthusiastic about a certain subject or topic. Um, we also have um, a pretty good group of um, retirees who are looking for um, interesting ways to volunteer and give their time. Um, and we also have a very strong um, core of educators um, who are using the transcriptions in the classroom with their students. Um, in fact, uh, Barbara and I were part of a webinar um, last week about Whitman for the National Council of Teachers of English. Um, and there were um, educators there who were looking for new things to do um, in their classroom. And, you know, they come from all over the world. Um, so they're not just based in the US. Um, I was working with a volunteer just last week um, based in France who was interested in lending his language skills to transcribing some of our French legal reports. Um, and the great thing about um, the people who volunteer with by the people is that um, they find what they're doing to be um, enriching um, as much or maybe more so than what the library receives as an output. Um, so they're constantly you know, emailing us, letting us know what they've learned. Um, and you know, for most of these people um, who aren't subject matter experts, these, this may be the first time that they're ever looking at you know, a Whitman diary or um, you know, something from Mary Church Terrell, who was a co-founder of the NAACP. Um, in fact, we heard from a volunteer um, this week that um, he first learned about the Tulsa Race Massacre by transcribing a collection um, that we had put up last year um, from Mary Church Terrell. So it's, um, like I said, as, as much about, you know, that public engagement piece as it is about um, the transcriptions that are produced, although those are very, very valuable to us and valuable to the people that use them. And one of the ways they're valuable is that when they're ETL'd, it will make our digital humanities sites more keyword searchable. So it's another way of discovery for people to use the materials. So in some ways by the people is its own beast. In other ways, it's a stepping stone to this other use for, um, for the collection-based digital humanities projects, which is really wonderful. Um, we were th thinking earlier about Zach discovering printed um, materials that um, perhaps were written under pseudonyms or were little known. And in a way, I think crowdsourcing um, through by the people, when people can choose what, prod what bucket to open and which notebook they want to start with or what page they want to concentrate in, it's their own process of discovery and choice. Um, and that's a, something wonderful too. And it gets back also to your book about um, the idea of choosing an object or an item from primary sources and to do a really close reading or, or analysis of that. And so people can transcribe and move on, but they can also re go and research the notebook that they transcribed and use it in the classroom. And it kind of has, an, the notebooks themselves are dynamic. The process of interactive um, crowdsourcing to, uh, transcription is dynamic and it, has the potential for continually um, being reinvented as people use them over time. So it's, it's a pretty wonderful process. In this next part of the program, we had all talked ahead of time and thought it would be a good idea to look at you know, some particular notebooks. Um, and Zach and Matt, I'm gonna rely on you to do most of the analysis in this section. And this first example is uh, from what is often called the Dick Hunt Notebook. And it, I'll explain to um, those tuning in that that is a reference to the name of a person who's, who is noted in the notebook pages. Um, and it's also a bit of a pun. And in these particular pages that we're showing here, Whitman has listed many, 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 many names of men. And they are men in Manhattan. And um, what do you think this is all about, Matt and Zach? <laughs> Matt, you want to go first? Oh, whatever. Do you do you want me to? I can. Yeah, give it a give it a go. Okay. Um, I mean, 
The temptation is to think this is his cruising manual, um, but it's more likely just a collection of uh, Whitman writing names down with physical characteristics to help him remember people's names. I th that's what I think the main thing is going on here. It's just kind of a memory aid. Um, remember who people are, their names, what they look like so that he can be personable with them. And that's an interesting thing in itself. It tells us something about Whitman's sociability and how he wanted to treat ordinary people that he encountered, lots of ordinary people. It also tells us who he was encountering because if I'm right about that, then um, there's like, I think two or three women total mentioned out of hundreds and hundreds of people. So his sociability would seem to have been very heavily dominated by engagements with men. Now, were some of these men Whitman's lovers? Possibly, possibly. Certainly some of the descriptions of, the, of them are erotic or seem erotic, appreciative at the very least of their beauty. There's one particularly interesting entry for someone who Whitman um, labels a hermaphrodite. Now, I don't know if he means that literally or if that was, I'm, I keep thinking about that line in this and I wonder, I'm wondering if that might not be some kind of code phrase that Whitman had. You know, we're starting to decode how LGBTQ people, people we today call LGBTQ, um, thought about themselves and described themselves and were described by others in the 19th century. Like we know from a, rec a recent article that the phrase counter jumper um, likely referred to um, effeminate gay men. Um, so I wonder if hermaphrodite, that line from this, isn't something kind of like that. Uh, or possibly uh, cross-dressing or, yeah. So, yeah, or, yeah, or intersex, mm -hmm. something we today call intersex Or transgendering, right. For, sure, who knows, but something like that. But then there's, there's lots of other tidbits like that in here that are mysterious and fascinating. And it's definitely one of my favorite passages in all the notebooks for sure. Me too, and, yeah. Zach, I want you to speak too, but I'll point out that on the right-hand page, we have the name Martha, which is one of the few women mentioned, but I think we can even wonder, is Martha a woman? Yeah, um, I. so I agree with Matt. This could be, to me, this is a sort of all purpose uh, document, you know, this could be a, a cruising manual slash record, <laughs> you know, it could be a kind of generalized address book Though there aren't a lot of addresses here, they're more like streets and, and places. But it's also a testament to how much Whitman cared for what he called the man on the street or the person on the street. There are so many people here that Whitman is obviously has met in his goings about town and you can see that he's just everywhere. He's everywhere. He's at the police station, Union Ferry, Fourth Ave, Mrs. Jones's. Um, it, the page you have up, Joe Downing, boy, often at the cigar store. Uh, it's probably cigar, not cigar, by the way. Um, Oliver, conductor, Myrtle Avenue. You know, he loves riding the omnibus. Blacksmith, son of a surgeon. Met at Dominique Colgan's, told me he was with me in Hayblock School. So, and he's listing the, the, the ages and the physical characteristics of a lot of these men. So for whatever reason, you know, and I think, I don't know the Whitman often drew distinct boundaries for, you know, the, the men that he met and why he cared to remember them. Um, this notebook is among other things, the records of a man about town, almost like, uh, you know, Stephen Dedalus in Joyce's Dublin throughout the day, you can practically track him and see just how many people he's whose hands he is shaking or who he is swapping stories with on the ferry or who he is teaching to spell at a lunch counter uh, or playing 20 questions with. I wanna ask you more about the 20 questions game, but you know, to me also these pages are like a litany that you know, he's saying these men's names and he gives you know, sometimes the physical characteristics of you know, the, the beautiful black hair, the mustache, the things that were, uh, help him remember or distinguish that person. And how many of the notebooks, even though they are technically prose, read like poetry? And so even these names of men read like poems. Um, and I, I wanted to read two short poems that, uh, that to me relate to this. And we haven't talked much about how you can use the notebooks in teaching and other, and just in thinking about what, what, what Wooden is doing by matching it with correspondence or matching it with prose writings or uh, with particular poems and not necessarily poems that are the trial lines in the notebooks, but other poems. 
And this again is from the, from, um, it's called For You, O oh Democracy. Come, I will make the continent indissolvable. I will make the most splendid race the sun ever shone upon. There's that word of race that you mentioned earlier, Matt. I will make divine magnetic lands with the love of comrades, with the lifelong love of comrades. I will plant companionship thick as trees along all the rivers of America and along the shores of the Great Lakes and all over the prairies. I will make inseparable cities with their arms around each other's necks by the love of comrades, by the manly love of comrades. For you, these, for me, O oh, democracy, to serve you, ma femme. For you, for you, I am trilling these songs. So, you know, I look at the pages and I think of Song of Occupations, but also, you know, Whitman as the poet of democracy and how it was embodied in the all these working men that he literally knew. And I love that they exist for us still in some way by reading their names and um, it makes their identities real to us. Did you wanna talk about 20 questions? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, this is not something that was unknown before, but in, in this notebook, uh, as well as I think maybe at least one other, you can find games of 20 questions that you can follow along from beginning to end. Um, and they're really quite fascinating. You, again, you get a sense of specificity. So also in this notebook, in the Dick Hunt notebook, um, Whitman writes at one point, I must not fail to saturate my poems, underline saturate, with things, substantial, American scenes, climates, names, places, words, permanent facts, etc. He's got this whole list and they're all underlined and there's a manicule pointing at them. Um, he's really interested in specificity. You're not just like a man, but this man here, his name is you know, Pickett, Charlie, William, John Balsier. Um, and in 20 questions, you get that very similar sense of specificity that there's literally a place that he's in. Um, oftentimes, you can see the game of 20 questions ranging around the room. You know, it'll begin with like a mineral, manufactured, instrument, etc. And then towards the end of the game, it will start to be like a, a on, you know, in the portico, like on the ground. And then when they get to the end, it's, it's, a, it's a joist or it's a bevel. Um, you not only get a sense that Whitman and wh whoever he is playing with are interested in these mechanics tools, these carpenters tools, but they're at a specific place. They're in a lunch counter or they are at, uh, in a boarding house or something like that. You can be there with them and feel what they are feeling and feel the humor of the situation. And to add just a little bit to that, as with the names, which as we suggested just a moment ago, seem to foreshadow Whitman's catalogs, right? You know, where people like in Song of Occupations, where people at work and their physical characteristics and descriptions, you can see when you read this, this manuscript, how this leads to that, the parallelism in, inherent in the form um, and, the, and the structure of naming something and then describing it, very simple structure. Um, but likewise, in the 20 questions, it might not seem as obvious of a source for poetry. However, we know that one of his games of 20 questions actually was edited into the unusually um, rhyming um, section that opens Song of the Broad uh, I think it goes something like this, a weapon, naked, shapely, wan, to be leaned upon or lean on. And I can't remember the whole thing, but it's it's like a... I think it's an octet of, of, of rhyming couplets, if I remember correctly. I, I can, somebody can correct me if that's not right. Um, and we find that it started out as a game of 20 questions. It was, you know, naked. These were like hints, these were clues in the 20 questions games, those, those descriptions that he just kind of edited and tooled around with until it came out in a poem. So uh, Whitman was omnivorous. He, he would use almost any prose source he could find and, and kind of massage it into into beautiful beautiful lines of poetry and you know i just listening to you talk i think about whitman and tools and the fact that he was a carpenter and a contractor and that he built things and 
you know, I, I never thought about the things he was building as part of the foreground, you know, things, you know, the, the skill of putting a house together or ordering lumber or ordering a, using a, a, an ax or, you know, the, a hammer, things like that, that it's another metaphor about how he constructed things from parts and the materiality of Whitman. So um, it, it's endlessly fascinating. Are we ready for the next example? Absolutely. Okay. So this is another notebook and it's often called No Doubt the E-Flux Notebook. As you can see at the top of the page there, it begins with that phrase. And it's dated, you know, again, before the first edition of Leaves of Grass. And um, something very interesting happens on this particular page that if, if once someone was transcribing it, they would discover. And it's about this person that Whitman glimpses on a rail car. So again, Matt and Zach, would you like to kind of expound upon what you think about this page and the rest of the notebook? Certainly. Right. This is on page 17 of Every Hour, Every Atom, if people are following along with the book. Sure. This is one that Zach and I talked about that evening at my apartment after the talks for Whitman's 200th birthday. Um, we agree that it was one of his most exciting and spiritually, uh, what's the right word, cosmic notebooks. Mm -hmm. If if like me, feel free to jump in anytime, Zach. If like me, you, um, you know, you had, admire and love the, the 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 cosmic early Whitman who you know soars through the cosmos in his catalogs and seems alive with spiritual discovery and is on the path of this like uh, you know religious adventure almost right um, a spree a holy spree um, you'll love this notebook because this is Whitman at his most engaged in my view mystically engaged this is the this is the notebook I, I turn to when I want to read Whitman on fire with mystical insight. Um, what do you yeah, think? Absolutely. This it, also, what is so delightful about this notebook is just the particulars of it. You you would think that going through Whitman's notebooks that they would all be relatively similar after a while. That you get a sense of sameness and repetition and maybe even boredom, but they are not. I mean, number one, this notebook. Um, is really, really small. Most of these, as Matt can attest, because he's held at least a few of them, are just tiny, um, like the size of the palm of your hand and hand-stitched. And this one is almost entirely prose as opposed to poetry. And as Matt said, this one seems to be a kind of spiritual effusion about not only the meaning of poetry, but the poet and the soul and men and women who he sees, however glancingly. And he's, he's doing that rhapsodizing about not only the present, but the future. You can see right here on the page that he's effusing about the efflux of the soul uh, that we may at some future period, perhaps a few score millions of years, we may understand better. That's a really, uh, that's quite a scope for an, a notebook jotting, right? This is like sentence number one. Um, and he's gonna go on to talk about all sorts of things, the gay procession and the wild trilling bugles of joy. And he says, uh, sometimes I think 10 million supple fingered gods are perpetually employed hiding beauty in the world. This, these are not lines, that, at least I don't think that one particularly, that appear in Leaves of Grass. These are the, the, like the shavings that are in the workshop. I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine these words, these lines just pouring from the pencil of this man who has spent the day building a house in Brooklyn with his father? The, the part that you were talking about is either uh, directly related to or adjacent to material related to the sleepers. Um, and the, 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 the penance of joy section and the, um, the, the, my favorite part, I don't know if we have an image of it, but he, he's trying to figure out the right word to finish a sentence and he leaves a blank because he can't think of the word. And, and the word, it's the blank of delight. And he's trying to describe maybe an orgasm or, or maybe it's some kind of like spiritual, sexual ecstasy, I don't know, you know, like Kama Sutra kind of thing. But it's like something intense and sexual and he can't find the right word for it. Um, Eventually, it winds up being the tooth of delight, which is obviously phallic. 
And that becomes a part of a passage that's describing, almost certainly describing, you know, um, oral sex in uh, the sleepers. Um, so this is one of the coded notebooks, I, I, as I put it, where he walks the line in being as frank as he can about some rather transgressive and intense either encounters or fantasies that he's recalling. It's hard to say. Um, but yeah, this is where you see the connection between sexuality and spirituality in Whitman. Yeah. And I, I think another, I mean, there's, there's infinite things we can say about what makes these so, uh, so attractive and difficult to turn away from. But something that Matt and I, I think both kind of bonded over when transcribing these notebooks is that you do see things like Whitman coming up with a blank or building kind of the skeleton of a poem where he'll start with the first few words and then kind of almost draw little lines like, okay, it'll go like this, one, two, three, four. Um, and he'll leave blanks if he's hard up for a word, or he'll write out a list of 10 synonyms and kind of dither with all of them. You can see that even though this is, this is unbelievably uh, magniloquent work, um, that it, it's not just leaping into the world fully formed, that this is a person who's sweating over this work. Um, yeah, I mean, and we haven't even gotten to other things like like erasures, for example. I mean, there's so many times, not so much in this notebook, where there's a, a word that's partially legible and you, you feel like you could just get it if you could reach in a little bit further. Um, there's so many points in these journals that are, or these notebooks and manuscripts that are almost accessible, but still kind of um, evanescent. I wanted to ask Abby about that, that this particular page, um, there are various uh, cross outs and things written above lines and below lines. And can you say a little bit of how by the people decided to do the transcription to show those kinds of things and what the square brackets are when the transcript we see? Sure, so, um, and I will say one thing that I loved about um, Matt and Zach, your transcriptions is that you you do actually get the physical form um, in, in looking at what you've done. But the what we've chosen to do is really um, get people to transcribe what they see. So you'll notice that you know we do make something um, in brackets when it's been deleted, but when something's inserted, we just add it as it would have been read, you know, inserted in the sentence. So you can see that um, in the fourth line there. Um, you know, whereas whereas in your work, uh, Zach and Matt, you actually keep the the insertion um, as 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 it appears uh, physically. So, and that's really because um, you know this what you're seeing here on the screen will go into the library's database, and you know we need it to be searchable. And so, making sure that there are kind of the least amount of um, unique symbols in the transcription as possible. Um, and also, you know, people see this on the library's catalog right next to the original image. So they're able to read the transcription, but also see it um, to be able to understand where things are inserted or deleted. And the, but, ju the juxtaposition is really important, isn't it, about understanding um, the text? And, and how the person that transcribed interpreted it, and then someone else reviews these texts. Yeah, so at least one other volunteer will review. So you'll see that this one is actually in need of review. Um, and that's to um, hopefully make sure that they're um, accurate. Um, but, you know, they're not, um, they're not always 100% perfect. Um, and that's why having them alongside the original image is really important. And, and sometimes as, as Zach was saying, it can be very hard to tell what the word is or something that's partially written, um, just maybe sometimes a few letters of a word that are crossed out. And one of the changes here that I thought was so interesting for Pride Month purposes is this kind of transgendered language that Whitman uses when he is looking at the workman um, that he glimpses his half turned face on the rail car and then he changes the workman into a woman. And so, you know, Matt, very early on, you were talking about, you know, when you see the published versions of the notebooks, you, you lose some of those changes and the, the nuances and the, um, the thinking process 
and some of the things that Whitman was struggling with. So we actually see him struggling here or just deciding to change the gender of the half-turned face. And did anybody have something they wanted to say about that, about you know his, his association of love and attraction and that he did sometimes talk about men and then change it to women? Well, I mean, I, I'm, when Whitman does that, it can be very interesting. And um, there's, I'm not sure that it's maybe the earliest, maybe the first assumption might be that he's doing that out of an evasive um, thought process, trying to code it, trying to make it more acceptable for a deeply homophobic era. Um, but that's not always the case. And there have been some really interesting um, studies done. There's a really interesting debate about a poem called Live Oak with Moss. Uh, and the question is whether Whitman tried to tone it down to make it more uh, normative, as the word goes, um, or whether the changes that he did, which do in fact make it less frankly sexual, um, weren't done because he just thought it made it a better poem. You know, so we, we it's important to not jump to assumptions about it based on our own interests. You know, I, I'm very interested in the um, erotic moments in Whitman's notebooks, but I. I'm hesitant to always assume that they're literally about sex. Uh, a lot of times sex is a metaphor um, or um, it's it's being used in a kind of like broader cultural sense as a kind of like metonym for um, procreation of the race. Um, thinking about work we're doing on uh, manly health and training right now, which is really obsessed with that idea. Um, so yeah, I, I think that, that it, he was obviously somebody that was fascinated with his own erotic thoughts. There's like a masturbatory quality to some of the notebooks almost, um, but it's not always quite so simple. Like that often seems tied to other concerns or is a way of him troping um, something that he can't talk about directly. And this whole notebook in a way is a, it's about mysticism in the body, but it's also about love and attraction. And all these kinds of nuances are variations on love of attraction. So we see him varying this right here on the page. And then as he goes on, um, you know, parts of this notebook became Poem of the Open Road, um, and uh, which many people interpret as a poem about fraternity and freedom of the road and who you might meet on the road. Um, Zach, did you want to say anything more before we go to the next notebook? Or? Let's go to the next. Let's go okay. in here. So this is the third one that we chose. And this is, um, it, it's actually described in the Feinberg Finding Aid as a um, address book, but it is a Civil War notebook. Um, it has addresses in it. And that's what, another thing we could say about the notebooks that it's, they're probably all best called notebooks because they may have a real uh, um, kind of hit or miss kind of content that he would write no, uh, notes about what he was reading or um, people that he had met, addresses. In this case, when he was in the Civil War hospital wards, he wrote down uh, the names of soldiers and the, also sometimes their families who he was writing letters to from them. But this particular passage, he is working on what became a poem for drum taps. And um, did we want to just read it aloud? Did you want to talk a little about, um, you know, what you see in these pages? I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I, I guess one thing to say is that um, Matt and I had to make a, a practical decision of where to stop so there, there's so many notebooks and fragments you know that don't all fit into one book um and we ended up deciding to stop just prior to the civil war not only as a kind of convenience you know it is a fairly major cultural line but also because of the tonal shift in a lot of these manuscripts it, it becomes a very different exercise for whitman to not only write down names and addresses and fragments of prose but also draft poetry like this because rather than it's being a record of him you know thumping an omnibus driver on the back or playing 20 questions or you know thinking about the moment of lingering after a stranger looking at the curve of their shoulder and the beauty of their face he's watching 
these beautiful people, the ones whose spirituality and magnetism and, and handsomeness and, and physiques and words had encapsulated America for him. He's watching them be cut down and in this case, die slowly. Um, you know, as a, as a nurse in Washington, DC, he experiences something very different. And so, um, you know, reading these is really, it, it, it takes a different sort of gear to kind of process this. I think the other thing I would say is that um, looking at pages like this also reminds me that Matt and I had to make all kinds of tiny little granular choices. Um, for example, we know that this is poetry. You know, as you said, this is a draft for a poem that will eventually appear in some form in drum taps. But oftentimes, Whitman's use even of things like the indent make it very unclear when a passage is prose or poetry or maybe both. And we had to kind of decide the rules of the game ahead of time as to how we would present these so that we are as little as possible making these, you know, part of a thesis about the neat notebooks so much as just giving them to readers to decide for themselves. Yeah, th I, this is an interesting um, early, apparently early version of a poem called Vigil Strange I Kept on the Field One Night um, from Drum Taps. Um, I haven't spent too much time looking at, I think I've glanced at this before, but I've never really studied this, um, this particular page, but I'm noticing how different it is mainly from the poem. Um, the lengths of the lines are shorter mostly and the order is completely different. Um, so and you yeah. turn the pages to the side, which uh, it, at least, you know, based on all the work we put into this volume, I was relatively rare, like sideways writing in the notebook may indicate a thing like it may not you know this is a Whitman who's like wiping the tears from his face at the end of the day scr scrawling these things in pencil but to turn the notebook to the side and to to generate the length for these lines that that would give him um, may indicate that he's trying to literally put bigger thoughts on the page that there are there are feelings um, that there are meanings here that can't be contained the other way because he would he would even sometimes like turn it around and start from the back and that those can indicate like different sections or chapters of thought within a notebook like these structural physical structural shiftings yeah or yeah. picking it up at a different time that you know th that sometimes it's difficult to date the span of a notebook because as we all do when if those of us who keep diaries or notebooks we may fill them half up and then set them aside and then later he's picking it up and he's starting from the back and going yeah. and using it at a different time. Um, so that we, we can't necessarily assume that one part of the notebook was written at the same time as the other. We one thing that I, I love about this um, opening and the Vigil Strange I Kept on the Field One Night poem, it, it's they're extraordinary love poems. Um, we started with a short love poem about, you know, meeting a lover in a bar and this is the loss of a of a young boy that you know he says my lover dear comrade hours with my lover dear comrade you not a tear not a word and the pain of of you know being with someone that he had come to care about um, dying and then how he re reworks it into the really marvelous poem in drum taps of uh, the on the theme of one soldier who's stricken down, the other continues the battle and returns to the side of his dead friend. And um, I'm looking at my watch and it's 10 to eight. Do we want to try a little transcription or would we like to turn to questions and answers? I suppose it depends on how many questions there are. Okay, Abby, do you think we might be able to live transcribe something together? We were having some technical difficulties earlier. Yeah, it looks like it's it should be working. Um, so let's see, I should be able to share my screen. Okay. So I should stop sharing.
you should be able to see my screen at this point. Not yet, Abby. Okay. It's looking black for us for the moment. Yeah, maybe give it another moment until it might be processing. So, oh, I was gonna say that, you know, this process is something we sometimes do with teachers and students, and it's a kind of read aloud, but I'll let Abby just explain how to do it. Once she, it once she get it back. <laughs> is it showing up now? I still have a black screen. Slowly but surely. <laughs> we saw a glimpse of it and it kind of went away. Yeah. Well, while we wait, there's something I can say about the, the poem that we were just reading in manuscript. Um, besides that rotation 90 degrees, which is, at least for me, it's a fairly rare moment, one that really um, feels meaningful. Um, I think we should all be thankful for one little variable here, which is that often, or even almost always, Whitman is writing with a little pencil, almost like what we would call a golf pencil now, without an eraser. So as we either transcribe live or look at more images shortly, you'll note that over and over again, Whitman is scrawling out or canceling or striking through words or lines or even whole pages, but not erasing. And because of this delightful fact, we get so much more of the process. If he had had a, you know, a kind of number two pencil that we have today with this, this fine eraser that works well, um, so much would have been lost of the process. And instead we get the, we get the whole thing, the, the woolly manuscript with all of the little stops and starts um, preserved beautifully mm -hmm. in his mercifully gorgeous handwriting, by the way. Well, at this point, I think if you're not seeing my screen, then we may not be able to do uh, do a live transcription. Should I try to get back into the slides and we can look there? Yeah, yeah and uh, what yeah. I'll do is I'll, I'll drop a link to what we were thinking about and then folks can take a look at it on their own and even try transcribing if they'd like. So can, um, can you see the, the screen with the notebook and the transcription now the, from my screen? We can. Yes, yes. You can? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can. There's also a question in the comments. Um, okay. Interested. It's from Margaret uh, Gardy, who says, hi, sorry to change the subject, but I don't often have an opportunity like this. Has anyone found the quote, real Jack Engel? Um, personally, I don't know if anyone else has any information. I'm not sure. I, I don't know who the real Jack Engel would be in this case. Um, the novella does make these grandiose claims that it is based in fact and that the, you know some people will be shocked to find themselves depicted and in that regard there do seem to be some figures in there who correspond to real real personages um not least the the evil quaker lawyer um mr covert attorney at law who seems to correspond to some real estate developer or or some such person who screwed over whitman's father at some point um, but as for jack engel himself the sort of plucky um, orphan law students? I don't know. Did we want to take a look at the, um, the Crossing Brooklyn Ferry or George Walker notebook, these particular pages? Um, we can just do what we were doing with the uh, earlier three and take a look and of you know, what Whitman has on the page. And it resonates back to some of the other material we've already looked at in terms of the references to slavery and to the solitary sick person. Yeah, why don't we? Um, and if anyone listening has any questions, they could drop them in the chat at any time. Sure. Who wants to take a go at it? of reciting this, like transcribing this live? We, 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 we could do that. Do you want to read it aloud? Uh, OK. Um, it's a little bit small. Can you magnify the text at all? Um, Where the great remuneration is made in secret that will allure me. Where personal love reaches toward me, that will allure me. 
to the prisoner in his cell or the slave or the solitary sick person, it will certainly allure me. I do not know what in waiting, what is waiting for me to be, what is waiting for me to be, but I know that I shall be in great form and nation. I cannot prove it to you by anyone, but I know it is so. And then on the upside down, I'm just gonna, I think I'm gonna have to hurt my neck too much to try to do that one. Um, it's, is this the, it's the Emerson quote, right? I greet yes. you at the beginning of a great career, R.W. Emerson. Yeah, it's a rather important quote there, upside down. Yeah, but it, yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's an example of, um, Zach, what you were just saying about, you know, using the pages in different ways. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see too, at the end of the, the passage that Matt just read, there's something that looks like an asterisk. Um, and Whitman is, is almost always thinking, at least partially in typography. Um, you know, this is the person who is literally knows by the time he makes it, knows leaves backwards and forwards. Like he helps to typeset this book. You know, Ed Folsom has studied this extensively um, and wrote a great volume on this called Whitman Making Books, Books Making Whitman. Um, but he has typography in his head. In fact, in the chat, Dan Campion just asked about the word manicule, which he says is very Latinate. And Dan asks if Whitman would have thought of the doodle as maybe a quote dingbat, which was the printer's term. You know, I don't, I don't know, and maybe Matt or somebody else could speak to this, but I do agree that Whitman, <laughs> he almost always has the printer's or the typographic term at hand. Um, he, he loves the kind of language of the street, whether it's nicknames for people, like I'm just glancing in the notebook here and seeing things like uh, Bone Hardener or Harlem Charlie, Blower Bell, <laughs> Donuts, et cetera. And then also these terms that while Whitman, of course, really enjoys the sound of certain French words um, or the occasional Latin, Latinism or Italian at word, he al also loves that hard sounding, uh, you know, term of art from say printing, typography, native languages, et cetera. He was an amateur linguist and in tracking the origins of words, he discovered poetry some of his poems are about the origins of words. He kept notebooks about words. He at one time contemplating creating a dictionary of sp specific to American usages of language. So um, linguistics is an area, what we call linguistics, that Whitman was obsessed by in his early years, which in inflected and informed his, his poetry quite a bit. And um, I, don't, you know, I don't know if manicule is in that or not, but the whole manicule thing, I mean, maybe Dan who asked the question, I think knows this already, but manicules originate from um, 19th century newspaper advertising conventions where they would, you would pay extra money to have your want ad or your advertisement emphasized by a pointing manicule. It's kind of like paying to have your Facebook post promoted. Um, so they, they would, they would, you know, print the little pointy finger and, then people, more eyes would see your ad or want, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and so that's where he, he got the idea to do it. And Zach and I uh, sweated at great length over how to make it look most like the hands that he, you know, drew himself. Yeah. And all of these things, these um, drawings, the manicules, the turning of the text, the um, cross outs, it's, they all are about his appreciation for the physicality how language can be a physical entity. I mean, there's the notebook, one of the notebooks I love the most, not really a notebook, it's a, it's a fragment, is he is one where it's not, it's not even what he writes on it that I'm interested in. It's the fact that he ripped it off of his own wall. He took a piece of, of wallpaper, ripped it off his wall and started writing on it. <laughs> and you, know, you can see it because on the back of it, the wall the wallpaper is there. <laughs> and, yeah, sometimes um, you're desperate to get down that thought before you lose it, so. It really stresses how physical the relationship between language and you know, the, the, the compositional process was for him, and more so than for us. I'm looking at this laptop right now, and I, I, when I, I'm embarrassed by my own handwriting now because I'm so, I have so little practice in handwriting that when I do it, it looks like it was done by a child. <laughs> so like, I'm losing touch with that side of myself in terms of the language and 
I'm thoroughly digitized in my own relationship to language, but Whitman wasn't. Whitman was thoroughly in the analog when it comes to language. He was, and there's also, um, you know, there's, there are not a lot of boundaries between the different sorts of texts that he's, he's putting into these notebooks. So be, beyond handwriting and handwriting on the back of wallpaper and like scrap paper and, you know, the, 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 the leavings from the printer's office and Williamsburg tax forms and, you know, literally the, the, the dross, the, the thrown away paper would uh, be punningly called grass. And so leaves of grass is a nice punning ring to it. But he also will snip out little items from the newspaper and paste them into his notebooks too. And it needed to speak to Ed Folsom's question in the chat right now about whether or not we notice Whitman plagiarizing or borrowing in these notebooks. There's no big moment that really comes to mind, but you can see that the, there's a real porousness between Whitman borrowing something, Whitman plagiarizing it, Whitman writing down a thought based on someone's, someone else's wording and then rewording it later or forgetting that he had borrowed it. Um, he, you, it is tempting to call him shameless because occasionally, particularly in his journalism, Whitman is quite the plagiarizer. And Manly Health and Training is full of plagiarized passages, um, which you can explore, by the way, on uh, whitmanarchive.org, where it's presented digitally and all the plagiarized passages are indicated. But in many of the notebooks we transcribed, it, I'm, I'm sure further study would determine the extent to which they are borrowed or not. But you can, you can see that he's throwing it all in there. And you really get to start to wonder about the speed at which he's doing this, the, 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 the fervor in which he's writing, um, and whether or not he is borrowing with deliberateness or simply because he can't help but be, as Matt called him, omnivorous. I think, I think that's one reason he published under a pseudonym that he knew that he was borrowing and he's basically making money by doing this work and he didn't really want it identified with himself. So I don't think the borrowing would be the reason for the pseudonym. There's plenty of, of signed or well-attributed Whitman journalism in which he very thoroughly lifts from other sources. And occasionally he was even caught out by competitor newspapers and, and called to account, which he did not appreciate. Um, but I, I think more likely the pen name is for the latter reason that you mentioned that the, the Whitman that we've been talking about this whole time, the Whitman of the early, mid and late 1850s is one who is developing this persona of the, of the loafer poet, the rough, right? He's one of the roughs, you know, he likes a beard and a freckled face. He's the one with his hand on his hip who's looking us in the eye and thrusting his pelvis at us, you know, happy pride month, everyone. Um, and so <laughs> to, you know, to put it in contemporary terms that I don't really like, he was managing a kind of new persona or brand. And I don't think he, he would really want those two to intersect. Um, you know, that, that poet, Whitman seems to have wanted to just seem as if he had appeared and had always been there. Whereas some of these other things, you know, his thoughts about um, men's wellness or his ideas for lecture series or dictionaries or primers of words feel like separate ventures and he therefore may have thought of them as being from separate print personae. I do think when you look at the notebooks to get back to the question about, can you tell some, when there's, when he's borrowing that I, there are times when you can tell, um, like one of the things that I've discovered when I was writing my first book was a, a, a passage, just like what the, was that Ed that asked that question? Um, with the author of that question, uh, Ed asked is a passage where he's transcribing from a bird book an, a book of ornithology, um, called The Birds of Manhattan by uh, the author named Giraud, G-I-R-A-U-D. G -I -R -A -U -D. And he's copying straight up from this book lines that would become lines in Song of Myself. And what's interesting is that at that point in the notebook where that appears, the, the handwriting is notably different. The way he held his hand, and the, you can just tell he's shifting in he's de his emotional intensity or something. It, it ref it's reflected in his so when I look at a notebook and I see a change in the um, script to the, the lean of it, or if he goes from pen to pencil or something like that, then I, I, my, my spidey sense, you know, uh, uh, flags itself. And I, I, I pay more attention to that as a place where that might be. Um, I think Zach's right about like covering up 
the rough edges of his collage process more thoroughly in the poetry than in the prose. And, and I think we'll find that more and more of his, we're just beginning to crack the surface of his journalism. And I predict that as the years go by, we're gonna see that more and more of it was uh, cut and pasted or, or rewritten. Um, I'm, I'm stressing out right now because I've got this whole article about Walt Whitman's bare knuckle prize fighting writing. And I have very little idea of how much of it is truly original to Whitman or how much of it is because uh, it's really hard to do that work to like find out to you have to search all these incredibly obscure notebooks, many of which I'm sorry, newspapers, many of which aren't online in searchable form. So it's, it's yeah. difficult work to sort out that stuff, and especially in the journalism. Yeah, but the, you know, the last thing I will say about this issue is that in notebooks, there are no rules. <laughs> like, you know, Barbara, as you mentioned before, many of us write privately in this way. Um, and, it, you know, it's one thing to put it in type and, and sort of put it out there under, under a byline or not, but in these fragments and in these notebooks, the, the sort of volcanic creativity that Whitman is experiencing um, it knows no bounds. I think that's a great place maybe to end. I'm looking at my watch and, you know, the volcanic um, creativity, what a great phrase. And I want to encourage everybody who's tuned in tonight to um, read every hour, every atom and enjoy it and to consider volunteering for By the People and the Whitman campaign. So we'd love to have you join us and to become you know, part of the great collaboration and community around Walt Whitman. And Barbara, Matt, Zach, Abby, amazing. I mean, you gave us such a portrait of Whitman that you're also making so accessible to so many people. So thank you so much for coming tonight and for putting this together. You did an amazing job too, collaborating on all of this, bringing all these unusual Whitman parts that now are available in book form. And I'm actually going to put the link for the book in the chat now if you're interested in purchasing. If you don't own it yet, you can uh, order every hour, every atom. I'm going to put that right in there. And we do have a few uh, questions in the chat, but what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to email them to everyone. And then if you want to you know, write back, maybe have a little time to think about it, we can do that for sure. But what an amazing night. Thank you so much. I want everyone to unmute for just a moment to so give a big, well-deserved round of applause. Yay. And Cynthia, would you like to come back for a moment? I see your internet is behaving tonight, Cynthia. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I want to offer my thanks with Caitlin and the audience, I'm sure. I see uh, very uh, recognizable names. I say hello to all of you in the audience. I don't see everybody on my self, small screen, but welcome to friends, uh, Whitman Scholars, and you're far. And uh, this was fascinating. I mean, I just was enthralled. I have two computers going here. So I turned to a bigger one where I have a better view uh, when I'm turning to the side. And it was just fascinating. Uh, Barbara, thank you for bringing this to the forefront, the transcription and uh, Matt and Zachary and um, Abby for your help in, in furthering this. Uh, but the conversation was just so rich. It leaves me with so much to think about. I especially like your comment, I think, Matt, about different handwritings and writing with a smaller pen and, you know, what that would signify about what he was thinking or doing. And the whole concept of, uh, you know, plagiarizing is somewhat new to me. So I'm, I'm hanging on the end of my seat, you know, learning something new again about Walt Whitman, which uh, is wonderful in my job. And I'm sure you all find this every day as a new discovery. So, um, and thank you for bringing your discoveries to us tonight, to everyone that's uh, watching and here. I, on their behalf, I say thank you. And I'd love to do this again in another day and age and shape and form, maybe in person would be wonderful. So thank you so much. And um, everyone just enjoy, be well and be safe and uh, continue reading our Whitman. Thank you. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I have all those links in the chat, so please definitely check those out. Continue following Whitman. Uh, I can't help but think of this quote, so I just need to add it here. Uh, Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. 
that's what you are doing for us. You're hunting Whitman, you're finding him, you're, he left you this trail and you're all finding it. So thank you for so much for sharing it with us, you know, putting it in a way that we can all understand and feel connected to Whitman, especially right after his birthday. It's really a beautiful thing. Thank you so much. All right, I hope to see you all soon virtually. Having a wonderful almost weekend to everyone. Thank you. So long. Good night, everyone. Good night.